Hi, everybody. Uh, we'll just give it another minute to let people uh, log in, but you're more than welcome to our webinar today. Okay, uh, we might we might start. I'm sure anyone else joining us, um, this will be on on demand. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Robbie McKiernan. I'm a field sales representative here at uh, Google Cloud, and I specifically um, manage our Looker product. Um, so today, I'm going to take you through um, a short presentation and introduce you to two of our brilliant customers um, who who will be on on in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to get into what we're going to cover today. Um, we're really here for to hear how, how kind of Monster and Hubs uh, use Looker, and we'll kind of uh, have, a, have a nice fireside chat with them afterwards. Um, please do pop any questions into the Q&A, and we'll be sure to ask and cover as many as we possibly can. And if we don't, we'll be happy to follow up with you. So yeah, um, I'm going to take you through uh, a couple of slides just to give you an idea of what Looker is, how we fit into the Google Cloud ecosystem, and um, and then I'll pass over to our two customers in Monster and Hubs to kind of walk you through their experience with Looker. Um, and then, like I said, we'll have kind of a panel discussion. Please do pop any questions into the Q&A chat as well, and we'll make sure to cover them. So yeah, without further ado, we'll, we'll kind of kick off now. So to give you an idea of Looker and what it is we do, we're kind of we're we're purchased by Google Cloud in 2019. Um, we're kind of put their enterprise BI platform. Our whole goal is to kind of deliver better data experiences to everybody within the business and their customers as well. Our, our focus is to kind of you know deliver data where and when you need it. And to kind of understand Looker, you've kind of got to go back a little bit to understand where BI has come from. So BI traditionally started with, you know, old data database tools um, and they involved quite a lot of extract and load. Um, there wasn't really much ability to self-serve people. There wasn't great time to value. And it was really based on those kind of monolithic stacks that existed before. Um, you know, you had great governance, but you didn't really have any other aspects that modern BI needs in terms of granularity self-serve and agility. Um, so there was a, a, an over-reliance on, on, on data teams. There was an over-reliance on analysts. And really, it was quite expensive to run. And then what we saw was kind of the explosion of the second wave of what we call the second wave of BI into those kind of cube tools. And that's where we saw the, the kind of more traditional workbook analytics tools present themselves that our hosts today will, will kind of cover in, in how they experience. But what you saw there was kind of uh, better data database tools, but still heavily reliant on extracts, uh, delivering a certain level of self-service capabilities as long as you knew what you were doing. Um, but really, those workbooks or those cube tools were limiting you in, in what you could do with your end users and how you could change your data cul culture. So it would be quite time consuming. The performance doesn't necessarily scale. Um, and the kind of level of granularity, unless they knew the end user knows how to write SQL, couldn't really uh, couldn't really get get to where people wanted to go. So data cultures couldn't really change. Most importantly, as well as these tools were kind of siloed in their own effect. They kind of lived as the as the data tool that you go to to log into, and then you kind of had the explosion of of, of kind of various different SaaS tools as well, where. You know your Salesforce.coms, your Marketos. They would tell you the information that you needed that was based off them. But in order to get a deeper level of analytics, you have to extract and load into a CSV file and have an analyst run the query. So it's quite time-consuming and didn't really drive that kind of data-driven culture. But with the change in kind of the cloud structure <clears throat> and data warehouses becoming heavily performant, 
um, a lot cheaper to run. And the move that most companies choose to make at the moment is towards that central model. What Looker spotted was a need there to deliver kind of that data-driven culture and that kind of ability for self-service uh, analytics. And that's what you really get when you look at, um, at, at, at Looker itself. With that infrastructure of setting up kind of a data warehouse and putting Looker on top, you have the ability to have your end users uh, ask and answer any question they want without an over-reliance on the data team because your data team used the modeling layer that is Looker and that's how we scale so well. Um, that will allow your kind of end users to ask any questions they want. Looker will write that SQL query and that data team will only have to set that up once and kind of hone in. And then it's something that goes back to, back to the wave one and wave two. It's about delivering data when and where people spend their day. To us, it's not a case of, um, you know, here's where you go to log into data. It's about incorporating it in with business critical tools, the likes of your Slacks and your HubSpots and your Salesforce. That is the whole goal of Looker is to become this kind of data dri data driven tool within your business that is easily accessible and isn't just another siloed, uh, siloed effect. So To give you an idea of the kind of infrastructure that we need uh, to work with, what we want to do is promote that idea of a central model. Put all that data into, into kind of one location, into a, a SQL speaking warehouse. Obviously, we're a Google Cloud company, so we do recommend BigQuery as well, but we speak to, I think, at last count, over 60 different dialects of SQL. So we're totally agnostic and plan to stay that way as well. The idea with Looker and how we scale so well is that modeling layer that I just mentioned. That's what's going to give you the security, um, the kind of go layer of governance in your in your kind of uh, in, in your kind of model and in your BI, to uh, give your end users the ability to kind of ask anything they want to, and you know that the the model that's sitting behind it that your kind of uh, data analysts have defined is going to deliver is going to kind of manage that and make sure that it can service them in in, in a structured way without you know them getting to, getting kind of confused or getting kind of questions wrong and then having to go back to the analyst team. Our idea is kind of broken into kind of four categories. Every BI tool should be able to deliver good visualizations because that's what our competitors do. And we do deliver good visualizations, but it's so much more than that. BI shouldn't stop there. You should be able to integrate it in with your business critical tools, maybe, you know, integrate it in with ad campaigns, with marketing campaigns, or with, with your, uh, with your, with kind of your, your, with your internal Slack instance, and then create those workflows that kind of, you know, automatically um, trigger once an action happens. So whether it's, you know, an issue with your product or an ad campaign that is overperforming, have Looker notify people of, the, of this um, in a timely manner so if they can action it straight away. And then go that kind of step further and customize Looker to the nth degree. It's, you know, built on that kind of API first approach. So we want to make sure that you're kind of able to customize this, deliver it possibly to your customers down the line as well, um, and kind of make it as easy as a workflow for your uh, for your both customers and your your internal uh, users. So that's very quickly uh, a little bit about Looker. I'm going to pass over to our uh, great customer Linda in uh, Monster, and she might just introduce herself and go through a couple of slides on how on how uh, how Monster use Looker. Thanks, Robbie. So as Robbie said. I am Linda Malby. I'm Director of Business Intelligence and Data Engineering here at Monster. Um, when I, whenever I say that, the first question I usually get is, which Monster is it that you work for? And to answer that question, the Monster that I work for is the recruitment company Monster. So we, we are a global online employment solutions company. Uh, we provide solutions for employment, career management, and recruitment solutions in general for job seekers and employers. We have a lot of data. So to give you an idea of the kind of data we are working with, um, we, we have all the data that comes from our website. In general, we have around 1.5 million jobs active on our US website at any point in time. This gives us a lot of data. So we have our jobs data. We have information about our candidates who are registered with the site. We have searchable CV databases. We have information about all of the jobs they apply for. Uh, we also work with the information around the site itself. So we use Google Analytics for site tracking. We feed that information into our data repositories as well. 
to lots of data that we're working with just now. As for our monster looker journey, Monster were founded back in 1994. We were actually one of the very first internet companies. As a result of that, we, we actually have a lot of old technology. We got to the point where we were working on old architecture. We had a lot of old play, play, uh, processes in place. In 1996, sorry, in 2016, we were purchased by Randstad, who are actually the world's largest recruitment company. And as a result of that, Randstad decided that they wanted to invest in Monster's technology stack from the ground up. And that means everything was up for grabs. So everything that fed our website, um, all the technology, technology behind that, all of our data centers was getting replaced. It's either been replaced already or we're in the process of replacing it. The idea behind that is to help us turn ourselves into a data-driven organization, get rid of all of that legacy infrastructure and legacy code that we have been stuck with for years now. So as Robbie mentioned, I find it quite interesting. He mentioned the different stages of BI. I have actually lived that in my time at Monster. I started back in 2009 when we were that kind of monolith stack. We, we had technology was driving BI. We were a bottleneck. We built the solutions. It took us ages to get anything out there. Then over time, we moved to that second wave where we saw us starting to use the likes of Power Pivot. We're starting to empower users to do more with their, their own data using Power Pivot and then onto Power BI. My, my BI team is very, very heavily into Power BI. I'd say we, we have been pushing the limits of Power BI. We're very much into the, the back end of Power BI as well, the metadata, how to make it scale to enterprise level. So with this whole replatform and the technology platforms, we, we were at a point we had to decide what BI tool do we want to use. A lot of our technology stack was driven by our parent company, Randstad. So they had global contracts in place for the Google technologies. Um, so before we even started on looking at BI tools, we knew our backend repositories were going to be in the Google platform. So going from there, so we started re-platform in 2019. Um, I started to work on lake development and warehouse development with my teams, pulling all the data in that we need, absolutely new sources. So everything, as I said, was getting rebuilt. So rebuilding those sources, building out the pipelines from scratch. Point, our data would be stored in GCP and BigQuery. We, we knew the data we were being fed. It was huge volumes of data when you were making use of nested data um, and normalized data. So we knew we had to find a tool that would work well with that. In all honesty, I've worked with Microsoft for 15, 20 years now. I didn't see myself moving away from Microsoft technologies, but knowing our underlying platform and what would work most efficiently with that, we were completely blown away with Looker when we, when we ran our POC. So we then, we finally signed our Looker contract in December last year. Um, and we, we have been running. We have been running constantly to get to the point of our Looker launch. We launched it in February of this year out to, I think we're about 300 users just now, 300 viewers. And I think we're about 100 power users. So power users, I say, are those that can explore the data. The reason for our tight timelines was we had to tie it in with our transformation. So our work stream to deliver the first version of the new pieces of the site delivered in February of this year. So we were aligned with that. So a huge rush to get it out there, but I think building out these foundational pieces of the warehouse in advance of that gave us a huge advantage to getting to the, the point of being able to deliver in February. So the previous model that we had, we I think we had a great opportunity because we were able to basically start from scratch again. We were in a bit of a unique position that everything is getting thrown away. We're starting from scratch. All of our data feeds are from scratch. It also gave us a chance to look at what hasn't been working before. With that kind of second wave of BI in particular, we, we came to the point where we had so many siloed reporting teams across Monster. We have different people with different versions of the truth, different versions of BI reports. My teams were spending so long just validating reports against each other. And often it gets to the point that different numbers are actually both valid, but there wasn't data governance in place to make sure which was the right number we wanted to present. So we we focused on getting those reporting teams into a position that they could self-serve, not preventing them getting access to the data that they need to support the job they do, but doing it in a governed way where we do have that one version of the truth, which is where Looker has completely completely solved a whole load of problems there with that, that metadata layer, that semantic layer. So on to a bit more about our data platform itself. So as I mentioned, our data platform is built on Google Cloud backend. A lot of that was driven by our Randstad contracts that were already in place. This diagram is taken from the perspective of my business intelligence team. 
and the first point they have contact with the data. So we land data within our data lake. My business intelligence team then pull that data into the data warehouse. The difference being the data lake is held, it's holding the data in a raw format, so it's close to original source information. When we promote to the warehouse, we're looking to optimise and process that data. So when I say optimise, we're looking at making our structures optimised for querying. So looking at partitioning, clustering, adding any business logic that also needs to go in there. The way we decided to di des sorry, design our platform at Monster was to build this concept of foundational layers. And the, re the reason I did that was because we are running so fast just now, we are really struggling to get requirements out of our end users. They're focused on the actual end product, what they need to get out of the website, what they need to get in the hand of customers. So for us to be able to get access to the, the data they need and to be able to help them understand if the changes they are making are making a difference, we need to give them access to as much data as possible. And Looker and our data warehouse in BigQuery has allowed us to do that. So this concept of foundational layers, we've built out a raw layer which has every single data point available. So something like our jobs information, we have over 300 data points there, which is all hugely nested information. What we have done is built a foundational layer within Looker as well. So we've got a foundational layer within the warehouse, built a foundational layer within Looker, which exposes all of those data points and restricting who can have access to that to a certain very targeted group of users. But never at any point can somebody say to me they can't get to any data point that they need. We are not blocking them in any way from getting the data to be able to transform the business. We then take that raw layer, or the raw models I call it, and are using the functionality of Looker to extend that. So we're using the same definitions in the, the base layer, but extending that to restrict, have a restricted, more curated view um, for more targeted audiences. So we're working with, we've brought in the concept of data stewards who work with us in that raw layer, define what fields and information they think other users should be consuming and make that available in targeted subset models, as we're calling them. So this is kind of the main area that we are at just now. So we're about six months into this, and we have those raw models out there, we have the subset models, and we're starting to get more into telling the story of our data. How do we start joining those subset models together? So if we're looking at something like our jobs information, joining it onto job applies, joining it onto who actually applied for those jobs, what characteristics do those applica applicants have, and making that kind of thing available to our users as well. So we've still got a long way to go. I'll talk about building it in foundations. If you think about our block, we're, we're probably on like the second or third floor just now. We have a long way to go to get there, but I think the foundations we've put in place and that reusability of code has put us in a huge position, a great position to be able to get to the, the end result we need to get to. I've just listed along the bottom here the technologies we are using to make this happen. As I said, this slide is focused on our BI journey and when data becomes available to the, the business intelligence team. Prior to that, we have our data engineering team also get, getting the data available to us. So we are, again, focused on the, the Google stack. We use Composer to orchestrate our data pipelines, PubSub for messaging, Dataflow, and BigQuery for SQL side of things. We deploy all through Terraform scripts as well. So that's a bit of background to Monster. So I'll pass it over to Robbie or Yuri in the... Yeah. Thanks a million, uh, Linda. That was great um, to hear. Uh, yeah, so if anyone has any questions for Linda, we'll be doing a, a, a chat after this. So do please pop them into the Q&A box. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Yurian uh, from uh, Hubs to kind of take you through their journey. So, Yurian. Thank you, Robbie, for the intro. Yeah, so my name is uh, Yuri Engerot. Uh, I work for Hubs as the head of analytics, formerly known as 3D Hubs. Uh, we recently rebranded in May, uh, and we were actually uh, bought by uh, ProLabs uh, in January 2021, uh, a US stock market company. Um, so when I joined, we were a scale up. Um, I think we started in 2013. Uh, and I actually joined last year in March, right in the pandemic. I was the first employee of 3D Hubs to quarantine, lucky me. Um, right when I joined, working from home. Um, and then I needed to step foot in a existing Looker implementation. Um, we were six months on its way. Uh, I think we bought Looker in October, 2019. Uh, so, um, before I actually worked with a lot of other BI tools, um, I worked four years with 
Tableau. I worked three years with uh, ClickSense, uh, and I worked some time with uh, SciSense. So I've basically seen them all, I guess. Um, but it was a really uh, surprising experience uh, falling into Looker and, and the way it navigates and the way it works with, uh, with its users. Um, so what does Hubs do? Well, we are actually empowering engineers to create revolutionary products, is what we say, as a mission. Um, so we have a distributed marketing manufacturing network. So how does it work? Um, engineers can upload a part uh, for an instant quote, and then there's a whole uh, pricing algorithm going on to uh, determine that instant quote price. Uh, we have a lot of data scientists working on that. Um, and then we evaluate the part, whether we can actually produce it or not. And we use different uh, materials and uh, technologies like CNC or 3D printing, uh, hence the formerly known name as 3D Hubs. Um, and then once we agree on the quote, uh, instantly we uh, source uh, through our distributed marketing uh, a manufacturing network. So we have manufacturing partners in India, in, uh, in China, in North America, all over the world. So even though you may upload your parts from Amsterdam, it could potentially be uh, sent from anywhere in the world because we have an auctions, auction system running in, in the background where our MPs can, uh, can put a bid on the part that was quoted by us. Uh, and of course, the difference between uh, the auction price and the initial price is the potential margin for us. So that's our playing field. Uh, and then once the manufacturing partner is chosen, uh, we provide real-time tracking and delivery of the order. So as well, a lot of data will come uh, into play when it comes to that process. Uh, so what are the kind of uh, customers we, we serve? What kind of industries we are uh, widely invested in uh, healthcare. Uh, we have actually parts serving around the globe in, in, throughout the space. We work with Kepler, for example. We have Uber as a, com a customer. Um, most companies come for us for prototyping uh, parts. Um, and then in some cases, we do small production series as well. Uh, so again, some numbers, uh, total parts produced. 6 million um, machines in the network, et cetera, but maybe the most interesting number for you. Bottom right, we have about 150 employees and about 90 active Luca users per month. Um, so that's quite a bit. And then if you look at our analytics stack, uh, we have different sources that we all try and glue together. Um, we have our own platform data, transactional data. We work with HubSpot for our customer CRM. Um, obviously, we advertise on AdWords and Bing. Uh, we have uh, Freshworks for our uh, other uh, CRM system on the customer side. And then we have NetSuite for our finance platform. And we process all this data through, at the moment, custom pipelines uh, through AWS and through Stitch. Uh, but we're actually in the moment migrating to something called uh, GetDBT. Uh, which is looking quite promising, actually, because they have a very similar way of, of um, developing the ETL uh, process as Looker does with when it comes to creating uh, LookML data. Um, so we're really looking forward to that in order to uh, invest more in a more solid uh, system of uh, data pipelines. Uh, we noticed with the custom data pipelines that it's still very challenging to maintain it all and uh, see everything through the forest of, of pipelines. And uh, I think TBT is a great orchestration tool for that. Uh, we push everything into Redshift, our data warehouse system, uh, which we have connected to Looker. Uh, so we are fully on the AWS stack and we think that Redshift will work just as well with Looker as uh, Google BigQuery. Um, even though it's a Google company. Um, so far, we never really had any performance issues. So uh, pretty happy with Redshift. Um, yeah, our only single source of truth nowadays is Looker. Uh, we come from Mode Analytics and uh, Google Spreadsheets. 
Uh, and I know that when we initially purchased Looker, Power BI and Tableau uh, were also considered, uh, but through social validation in the scale-up and startup space, uh, Looker came out actually as recommended and they simply set up a proof of concept and everybody was happy to move forward to purchase. Um, right now, we have three people who take care of the LookML. So what's LookML? Well, that's actually the semantic layer, the metadata layer, where you define all your sources, define all your measures and metrics, and make sure you have that consistent uh, KPI definitions in place. Um, and I think that's, for me, the most powerful uh, user of Looker, having that semantic layer. I remember the days uh, in uh, formerly uh, known BI tools where I always needed to copy and paste certain formulas for a certain uh, measure. Um, and then maybe certain measure calculation changes over time and then you're stuck because you need to update it in 20 different workbooks or 180 workbooks. Um, not so much centralized. We have uh, 80 viewer users and 35 explorer users. In the beginning, we really tried to push to keep as many fewer licenses as possible. That does not uh, due cost, but we try to uh, have people uh, focused on the job they're actually hired to do so. Uh, so a sales manager should do sales, and a sales manager shouldn't spend hours and hours in, uh, in Looker in our uh, experience uh, trying to find the data. So we try to have the best possible uh, standard dashboards for each department and uh, I think that uh, works really well but of course over time you want to grow with your users and people increase their data needs so we actually increase the number of Explore users. I think that's it for now. Great. Uh, cheers, you're in. Um, okay. Um, so, like with Linda, if, you, if anyone on the call has any questions, do please pop it into the Q&A. We're going to kind of spend the next few minutes going through some some questions that you you have all popped in and uh and yeah i think i might just kick off the questions though because both of you came into looker in very unique circumstances and linda i might go to to you first and just ask you where where did you decide to start with and then i suppose for yuri and to for you to prepare, where did you decide to start with considering um, that, you know, you came in six months after a project a product had been purchased? So it'd be good to hear, like, you know, bearing it down to your exact starting points. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Linda, I might go to you first. Okay. So from my perspective, my parent company, Randstad, actually already had Looker in place. So for six months before that, we actually used that as our POC environment. So when we were running our project testing out other BI tools, we made use of their environment. I took the opportunity then to learn as much as I can. I love just going out there and reading what's available online. I love looking at how other people have built things and seeing if I can build it for myself. So one of the things I frequently heard about Looker was concerns about visualizations. If you get out there and you dig into what other people have done um, and try and work out how they have done it, you can build hugely powerful dashboards as well. I'd also say it was it is a huge learning curve. Um, and I'd say from my perspective, we take maybe five steps forward and go a step back at the same time to keep us moving forward. So as we go, we are constantly learning new things, new ways of like extending LookML to be able to reuse code and making sure we, we implement that. We go backwards and fix what we have done before to keep learning from it. Great. And uh, Yurian, considering you kind of came in six months into the product, where, where, where did you start? Yeah. Um, so I know from experience that the initial launch is always key and to set up things right from the start, it really will help you in the long run to, to do it properly. Uh, so I did a small assessment on how they initially build up the, the data sources and build up the model. Um, in my own experience, if you have a lot of experience with other BI tools, the learning curve is not, not very steep. I mean, if you know how to write SQL, uh, you've come pretty far. Um, so for me, it was, yeah, auditing that initial setup, um, trying to find the value of Looker compared to other tools. Uh, indeed, initially I was like, well, why can I do, do this kind of visualization or why can I not color code things like this? Or 
but if the features are simply there, you get used to it and you work your way around it. And in the end, you, it turns out you're actually not missing them at all because it just streamlines uh, your uh, your way of uh, producing dashboards and um, uh, makes you much more efficient in the end. I uh, I experienced. Cool, great. So, Linda, I obviously work on the sales team, so I you know do a lot of proof of concepts of Looker with my solution engineer. Um, something that I always spot with uh, with proof of concepts is they can always go very, very wide, but sometimes an inch deep. Um, would you have any advice to people considering uh, a proof of concept of Looker that is on this call, where to focus, where you could maybe get the best value out of it? I know you spent a lot of time doing reading and stuff. Yeah, so, so we actually created a, a list of all the features that we wanted to make sure our tools had. So having worked with BI tools for 15 or so years, it's a lot of learnings from that. And it goes beyond how it looks or how easy it is to interact with, but the back end side of things, the management side of things, the enterprise level scalability, that kind of things. So we had a fully defined list of everything that we as a team wanted to be able to achieve from our BI tool to make it sustainable for us longer term. Um, and really just tackled it from that perspective. We used the same set of data throughout our different BI tools. So we knew we knew from our implementation of the data warehouse that we we're going to be working with that nested data. So we created a subset of uh, basically a little mark with nested data that we wanted to use across all of the tools. So we knew that was our back end, what tools would play nicely with that, and using that in parallel with all of the, the kind of more technical things that we needed to get out of it as well. Great. Brilliant. And uh, Jurian, you seem to have a very impressive uplift and a lot of the questions in the chat are, you know, how you got uh, your internal stakeholders to uh, to adopt Looker uh, and particularly kind of how you decided which role they are between viewers and uh, explorers. I don't know if you have anything to kind of comment on that or, or maybe talk a little bit around like what your strategy was to, to get people onto Looker. Sure. Um, so yeah, we have an analytics team of three uh, right now, and then we have separately uh, data engineers who are not uh, working on Looker, but they are advocates for you in the end as well. Um, and we selected per department one uh, data champ, uh, as we call them. Um, so that would be the designated analyst who could, you know, really stimulate the adoption rate uh, within the different departments, uh, and that would also be the the go-to person for the department to um, share the requirements and uh, and issues and challenges that they have with Looker. Um, and what also really helped for us is to have a couple uh, advocates uh, on sea level. Um, so I think we have our uh, chief operations officer and our chief finance officer who were really uh, well trained uh, with Luca right from the start uh, to really have that uh, top to bottom uh, uh, support in order to um, to roll out uh, Luca successfully. Uh, we just saw them uh, bringing in Luca data and Luca insights with any of the uh, the presentations they had or company events, and I think that really accelerated the overall awareness of Luca as the new source of truth. Uh, and more people really uh, were keen to get on board it uh, as quickly as possible. I hope that, uh, mm -hmm. that answers your question. Yeah, and just a follow up to that if obviously you have 150 people living in the business, there's 90 on Looker. If, if any of that kind of 60 that, that aren't on Looker uh, need access to reports, how do, you, how do you manage that at the moment? Is it kind of something as simple as the PDF? Yeah, you it's as simple as. It's as simple as a PDF. Uh, we send out weekly reports through through PDF format. Uh, we provide uh, insights on Slack, um, and for for most of those job roles, we deliberately choose not to let them uh, be exposed to to this kind of data because um, it just takes away of the focus of the job they need to do. Uh, so for for a number of people, it's just not relevant. Cool. 
makes sense. And uh, so just a question from uh, the chat here directed at Linda, but I, I think I'll put it to both of you. Um, so you were talking about one version of the truth for metrics, um, even when sometimes different results are true, how are you communicating and documenting what is the correct metric? Okay, so from a monster perspective, we, we have invested in a new data governance tool. So again, very early days with this, we've had it about six weeks now, but we are we have data stewards that we have aligned to each subject area. And whenever a KPI or metric is defined, we are working with that data steward to get a definition. There's an approval process for those KPIs. We once it's a, we're actually using this data governance tool for that approval process as well. Once it's approved, we implement it in Looker, and that is available for our users to start exploring. Cool. And Urian? Um, yeah, in our case, we, we simply have a system where people can put in requests um, when it comes to definition changes or, uh, or uh, ad hoc requests. Uh, we use Kenny as a tool, um, and we use Slack for our uh, under 10 minute questions to provide and when we have uh, 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 certain updates we simply communicate them through through email or on the various uh, slack channels that are uh, applicable our sales the main abuser of the under 10 minute question it feels like i would abuse that 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 category <laughs> for, for um, some reason not every department understands the 10 minute rule <laughs> Such as human nature. Um, okay, question for you, Linda, um, and, and Yuri, and I think you have a lot of experience with the, the other tools as well. But uh, for Linda, um, how did you shift? How did the shift go from Power BI to Looker? Um, are you still using Power BI for some reports, or have you made the full switch? I suppose you're still early in the process. But good to hear. Yeah. So again, because we are essentially starting from scratch, we have we're straddling both worlds just now. So we have our kind of what we're calling our dot now world, which is what we've been working with for years in our dot next world, which is our new implementation. So in our dot now world, we are still using Power BI heavily. We are moving away from that as we build more and more content in our new world. We naturally build it in Looker, which is quite nice because we don't have to do the kind of rebuilding of reports and trying to match things up. It's a completely new source that we have to work with. Uh, from a business perspective, the shift from Power BI was a challenge. When we showed them Looker, there were concerns around Power BI um, and losing some of the visualization capability. Whereas, from my perspective, I think Power BI in some ways has become too powerful in the visualization perspective. And I find that, that my team ended up spending so long working with bookmarks and rejigging like visualizations and tweaking it and having too many options within a report. Whereas Looker, I love the fact that we present numbers and they're there. There's no kind of working with bookmarks and trying to work with all this hidden stuff. The other challenge we have with Power BI is it's back to that kind of wave two that you were talking about. We have so many siloed reporting teams that have been empowered to build their own Power BI content. One of my biggest challenges was getting them on board with Looker as well. So as part of this transition, we, are, we have moved away from giving people raw SQL access. We got to the point that Monster, that on, so we were probably about a thousand people who had raw SQL access to our warehouse. So that kind of contributes to the different versions of the truth, the different versions of reports. So as part of that, we're I'm not preventing people getting access to the data, but trying to encourage them that they have to go through this governed semantic layer. So a lot of my time has actually been invested in almost like roadshows with those people and going out, helping them understand Looker, helping them understand the benefits of it, seeing that we're not preventing them from doing what they could do in Power BI, but empowering them to do it in a kind of a more constructive way and actually facilitating them, making them be able to get that data quicker. So we actually run, we run sessions every two weeks with our Power user community. And like Julian was saying there, we have a drop-in area as well. So we have a Teams channel that people can ask us any questions on and we provide support through that as well. So a lot of that transition piece, it, it's not necessarily people that are consuming Power BI for me, it's people that are building Power BI content as well and getting them into a new frame of mind of working with Looker instead of building out raw SQL queries and pulling that into Power BI. It's been one of my biggest challenges. A thousand people on your warehouse, I believe that would be uh, the this, definition yeah. of data Ch <laughs> chaos, all right. Exactly, yeah. Whereas now we're down to just developers having raw SQL access 
and nobody else is getting access at all. So even yeah. standing firm in that has been tough going as well, but people are now <laughs> seeing the power of liquor. And in all honesty, people are loving using liquor. I have um, even just my, my boss recently was able to get her hands on data that previously she'd have had to go to some of the analytics teams to extract that data for her, but with liquor, she's able to do it herself. And uh, how long would it have taken your boss and your analytics teams to kind of pull that sort of information? Oh, a long time. So a good few days at least, and it's something she could do instantly within a few minutes. And it, it even goes beyond that, actually. So it goes to the, the volumes of data we can work with. So with Power BI, one of the things we struggled with is people want access to kind of raw job level information. So looking at a specific job a customer posted, how many views, clicks and applies and things like that they get. To pull that in for one and a half million jobs for US alone into a Power BI report where it's storing that away from your data repository and trying to process that on a, a daily basis. We had so many problems trying to get people access to those volumes of data. Whereas Looker, because mm. it's querying at source, we're making use of the optimized backend. Mm. And Urian, do you still run on some legacy uh, reports or because you guys are um, a bit more of a scale up that the adoption seems to be taken up pretty quickly? Yeah, well, we set ourselves a deadline uh, last summer. I think it was one of my first tasks to uh, completely phase out uh, mode analytics. Uh, and of course, we had some users who it was hard for uh, for them to say goodbye to their old uh, tool that they got used to. Uh, and we had a lot of legacy reports running on that, uh, that platform. Uh, but we collaborated together to uh, uh, replicate uh, most of these reports uh, on Looker. Uh, and we simply set a hard deadline to, uh, to cut off the license. And uh, sometimes you just need to take access away and then see who, start, who starts peeping the first month, uh, who starts peeping the second month, and eventually it will all fade away. Because uh, uh, you don't give them a toys. And of course, you, you want to do this for the right reasons and people got to believe in the product. Uh, but yeah, for some people, it's just the habits uh, that you need to force a little bit uh, to, uh, to cut loose. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so um, no, we're fully really <laughs> open. Great. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So if anyone wants to pop any more questions in, but one that's interesting to me that I often hear and I thought of initially, Irian, when you said you were looking in DBT as well. So a question for both of you um, in the chat would be: How do you decide what to model in Looker and what to kind of model in your warehouse? And then I suppose for Irian, what you decide to model in DBT as well. I might go to Urian first on that. Hmm. Tr tricky question. Um, initially, we really wanted to stay, uh, how do you say that properly in English? Um, not too tied in to Looker. We wanted to yeah. stay uh, vendor independent. Um, so mm -hmm. we initially built like all possible logic where possible in, uh, in the data warehouse itself. Uh, just to give you that flexibility. And also we have still some users who uh, query the data warehouse directly and not through Looker. So there you want to have most definitions in place. Otherwise you keep, again, uh, having a situation where you have multiple uh, uh, people coming with, uh, with numbers that don't line up. Um, but in some cases you simply need to define it in Looker and, I think you just always got to ask yourself the question, could I define this in the, warehouse, in the data warehouse? Then yes, please do so, even though sometimes you get a little bit, uh, how do you say that, too easy with, and you, you really need to keep forcing yourself to also build it up in the, in the data warehouse where, where possible. And I think our data warehouse is really flexible to add upon and, and uh, build upon. I think it, it provides you the most flexibility and you don't get yourself into a situation where your whole LucaMail becomes this piece uh, that you could potentially never step out of or, or replace, uh, to be honest. Hmm. And, and Linda, do you have any, uh, any advice on that front? So my, my traditional best practice would be to build as much as possible in the warehouse. 
what we're finding is we're actually finding new ways of working because of Looker. We've formed a, a separate Scrum team, which is focused on data presentation, so getting visualizations out to people. And it, as part of that, me being Scottish as well, I worry about cost of everything. So this is a changed world for me that I, I look at the, the cost, the, the content other people are creating. Um, the cost that that generates every day. So every dashboard, what are the costs from BigQuery associated with that? And as part of this new data presentation team, I I feel as though I have to quickly turn things around. So yeah, my preferred approach would be to build a lot of aggregations and things in the warehouse, but with, with Looker and the concept of things like PDTs and to build that quick aggregation, I can look at a dashboard that this other team is creating. I can look at the aggregations that are suggested from Looker and I can get it built which means that we are hitting those costs like once a day instead of every time that dashboard is, is running. So it's got to be a bit of a balance. Longer term, I want to build more out in the warehouse side of things um, and build it out as incremental like aggregated loads. But just now, to just facilitate and get data into people's hands and try and keep the cost down as much as possible, I am finding we're doing more of that aggregation side of things within Looker just now. For things like calculations, it depends. It really depends what the calculation is. If it's something that's going to be heavy hitting on BigQuery, again, we try to do it in the warehouse, so it's done once. If it's something that we just want to get in somebody's hands quickly, we do it in Looker. And sometimes it's a two-phase approach. We do it in Looker, so it's out there quickly. Then we take a step back and do it in the warehouse later on. Great. Um, okay, great. I think we have time for one more question, and we'll end it on a, kind of a nice one because we've grilled you on on, on your tech knowledge. But in uh, in the kind of next six to twelve months, um, what's your kind of goals, and where do you see your BI journey being? I'll, Linda, I'll go to you. Sorry, it helps. It, it helps if I tell, ask the person, doesn't it? I almost made it the whole. I almost made it the whole one, guys. <laughs> uh, so for me, in six to twelve months, I hope we can slow down a bit. I say that jokingly a bit, but we do need to slow down. We are getting data out there quickly to facilitate a, an immediate need just now. But we need to take a step back. We need to start focusing on those aggregated layers, focusing on how we optimize joining various data sets together. Um, we also want to roll out to our sales teams. So just now we have our sales reps still using our data in Power BI. We want to roll look out to them. So that's an additional 300 or so viewers we're going to be looking at. We are also looking at how do we start using Looker for our external customers. So we have been working with the Looker teams, looking at things like the, the API usage, the uh, Looker embedded, and thinking about how we can start monetizing our data and offering different and you know, various product offerings or reporting product offerings to our customers directly. So instead of going back to where we started 10, 15 years ago, embedding SSRS within our customer web portals, we're now looking at how can we use Looker to pull data out of the APIs and present custom pages to them. Or even a drag and drop interface, I think would be absolutely amazing for our customers. Mm -hmm. And Yurian? Yeah. Um, so for us, uh, last year was the, what we call the year of the build. Um, building and providing all the different uh, departments uh, the basics of what they need. And then this year, our focus is uh, build less and use more. Um, so again, we really want trying to limit the amount of dashboards, the amount of re reports. You don't want to get yourself again into a place where uh, people, if they joined recently, they cannot navigate to the, to the reports they're actually using for because there are 15 different versions of it. Uh, so if there's a report in place, try to make that one better instead of, you know, adding another one to the mix. Um, so we're really trying to use, use the data as much as possible now. And what we do find uh, in cases is that uh, we probably need to do some auditing on the, on the measurements itself. Um, so people get a better grip of, okay, if a user clicks there in our platform, what does it eventually mean for that KPI? Uh, just getting a better grip and control on the, on the quality of our KPIs is, is the phase we are in. Um, like Linda mentioned as well, uh, embedded analytics is on our horizon. We are already providing our uh, MPs with automated PDF uh, reports that are generated by Looker on a monthly basis, 
Uh, so they get an individual uh, PDF page provided by Looker about their performance and how it's benchmarking to the, to the network, uh, which is a very powerful feature. And we want to build upon on that for, for the next time. Right. Right. Um, that sounds great. Um, yeah. So look, uh, I'm sorry, we didn't have time to answer everybody's questions, but we will follow up with you all and your uh, account representatives will reach out to just um, help you with any of those questions. Um, I'd like to thank our two uh, guests today, and Linda and Urian. Um, thank you for taking the time to 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 go through this and to uh, show off your Looker experience. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for joining us. Um, have a lovely rest of your week, and it was an absolute pleasure.